Okay, we're back. This is Dave Vellante and Jeff Kelly. We're with Wikibon. This is theCUBE, Silicon Angles production. We're here at the MIT Information Quality Symposium. This is day one for us. We'll be here all day tomorrow. Uh, and you know, going wall to wall coverage, you, you, those in our audience who follow theCUBE, you know how we go to these events. We bring the best guests that are at the event, extract the signal from the noise. And Jeff, the interesting thing about this event, you know, we have been covering big data for you know, several years now. And the interesting thing here is we've seen a couple of themes emerge in, in big data in the last couple of months that we haven't really been hearing. One is security, we had Eli Khan on from Squirrel talking about that. Uh, and it obviously had, a, had a, an information quality angle, but the other is this notion of data quality, information quality. Now we've certainly heard for years about the single version of the truth in the data warehousing business and, and, and the like, but now with the big data meme, I think people are, there's a heightened sensitivity to data quality. And it seems to me, Jeff, my observations are there's, there's, a, there's a time and a place for data quality. You know, what we've been hearing today is, look, if it's, if, it's, if it's Twitter data and you're trying to look at sentiment and you're getting a false positive, okay, that's not an issue. But we're hearing from healthcare practitioners, financial service practitioners, even you know, sectors of the government we've heard from the VA. Major challenges in terms of disparate systems, siloed systems that they're trying to bring together and communicate with each other. And another consistent theme that we're hearing is, you know, it's always people, process, and technology. The technology is the easy part. It's the people and, and the process. Yeah, but that's, that sounds you know, good, but when you really start to dig into how these practitioners have resolved these problems, it really is a lot of heavy, lif heavy lifting and a lot of hard work. So what were your takeaways from today? Well, a few things. So one, on, on the point about data quality in a big data context, um, you're right, it's, it's, it's less about having uh, you know, a perfect data temple with all your, all your data of, of you know, 100% uh, high quality, and it's more about the right level of data quality for the right application. Um, so that's one thing I took away from today. Um, another was the, you know, the, the role of the chief data officer is one that's still kind of evolving and emerging, but I think one thing I really took away from today was it's, it's not really, the focus really isn't just the data, it's about the business, and it's about listening. If there's one skill I took away, or one, uh, one, um, job that, I, that I, I heard from each of the chief data officers we talked to today that they really focus on is it's listening to the business. Um, you know, when they start, uh, when they join uh, their organizations, uh, Derek Strauss at TD Ameritrade we just spoke to, you know, the first thing he did uh, for the first hundred plus days was go out to the business and listen to their problems, their challenges, um, so that he could understand where to focus his efforts. So it's really about listening, communicating with the business, um, as much as it is about implementing technology um, to actually you know, apply uh, you know, data quality uh, to your data assets. Um, so those are two of the big things I took away, and you know, I think it's all about, again, having the right data in the right place at the right time, and less about having a pristine data temple. Um, that's really uh, one of the keys that I took away today. Well, and the, you know, the, the back in the day, the vision was always, okay, I have this data temple, I'm going to go out and buy the biggest Unix box I can find, right. I'm going to shove a bunch of data in there, you know, it's all going to be standard, and you know, I'm going to let the certain people access this, I'm going to set up processes, I'm going to build processes mm -hmm. around that data temple, and I'm going to build a single version of the truth. Well, that sounded good, but it didn't work, mm -hmm. actually, because, w it, because you, 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 you ended up with what the VA had. What, what that trend described today is very similar to a lot of organizations. We've got hundreds of systems, you know, many, many databases. They're all siloed. There's processes built up around each of those and they don't talk to each other. There's not a 360 degree view of the customer. We're not sharing customer data. Um, there's a lot of data entry going on. And of course that means a lot of potential for, for error. I, I don't think at all the big data initiative solves that problem. In fact, if anything, it makes it worse, right? So what I see happening here in my observation is that you're just seeing a lot of, as I said before, a lot of heavy lifting and practitioners are really trying to start uh, are understanding this problem. They're getting to the root cause. They're putting together data architectures. And I think they're, they're dealing with this big data as an opportunity, potentially to use analytics to, mm -hmm. to resolve some of the data inconsistencies, but also as a way to drive business value in ways that perhaps they couldn't with traditional methods. Um, and so I think you're seeing that uh, emerge. And we, 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 we talked uh, today about, you know, the old, we've had this discussion before, Jeff, the tail wagging the dog. 
and the, the balance of value. Uh, and I think that there, there will be a natural equilibrium reached between this new, emerging, unstructured, nouveau data, uh, as we heard today, uh, with the traditional data. So, so you're not going to be here tomorrow. Uh, actually, Paul Gillen is going to be doing you know, some of the co-hosting with us. So really excited to have, have Paul on. Paul is you know, really the reason why we're here and somebody who has collaborated with us in the past and, and, and has seen the evolution of the Wikibon <laughs> and SiliconANGLE community. So, so we're going to miss you tomorrow. But uh, Well, I wish I could be here. So but what are the um, things that we should be looking for uh, tomorrow that you want us to pay attention to? Well, I think continue exploring this role of the chief data officer. I'm fascinated by how this is, is, is evolving and, and actually in, in, in practical ways inside the organization. Where does the chief data officer sit in the organization? How does he or she effectively communicate with the rest of the business and, and, and disarm some of those parts of the organization that are you know, a little wary of that, uh, this new role? Um, you know, some other things I think I always love talking to practitioners who are you know, focused in different verticals and understanding really the implications, the real world implications, not the theoretical that we talk about sometimes, but the real world implications of bringing in new types of data, um, the pressures on chief data officers and other data professionals in financial services, in healthcare, in government, um, to really deliver analytics to end users who increasingly in this kind of this consumerization of IT world, they, you know, they want analytics and data at their fingertips, and I want it now. So there's, there's this increasing pressure um, on data professionals to deliver uh, solutions that their end users are, are looking for and to do it quickly. Um, so always interested how, uh, how people are tackling that problem. And then of course, as I, we mentioned earlier today, these are uh, some industries that are also under heavy regulatory uh, and compliance pressures. Um, so how that impacts what, the, what chief data officers, data scientists, other data professionals are able to do, and how they navigate those waters, because those are some Serious, uh, you know, consequences if you run afoul of, of compliance so and regulations. You, do, you so. do you agree with Derek? Do you, do you um, I mean, certainly he wants to see more chief data officers. That was a good interview. Um, mm -hmm. Do you agree that there will be? Do you think this is a natural progression? I mean, what he described at TD Ameritrade to me was unique. That the these organizations that he cherry picked, you know, really high quality people, and formed this new. Uh, 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 organization under a CDO, in many organizations, that would be like internecine battles to <laughs> actually yeah. have that occur. And well, it seemed to be fairly frictionless at, at, at TD Ameritrade. Now maybe that's because there was a business case behind it, you had, a, you know, COO was behind it, but what's your right. take on that? Well, I think part of it is exactly that, executive sponsorship. But, um, you know, I think we're going to increasingly see this because I think it was Derek who said, you know, you know in years past, the focus was on, was on, were, was on systems and apps and data didn't get a, as much of a consideration, and that's clearly changing. So, you know, data spans silos, right? It, it can apply to any number of, any number of parts of your organization. Um, and there are a number of unique uh, requirements and considerations when you're talking about data in the enterprise that aren't necessarily directly related or not coupled with the applications and systems that are really running the day-to-day -day business process. So, really, I think you're going to increasingly see chief data officers or people with maybe not exactly that title, but taking on some of those responsibilities of treating data as an asset inside the organization um, and, and finding the best ways to deliver data uh, and turn it into value for the d various business units uh, to ultimately you know, drive profits and in other, other cases to you know, save money, become more efficient. Um, you know, it's going to happen in some more data intensive industries sooner than in, in you know, other industries where data is not, at least now, considered um, critical. But you know, as we move forward, there's really, as we've talked about on the Cube and in our research, there really isn't a vertical market that's not going to be impacted by um, data in the next 5, 10, 20 years. I mean, even something like agriculture, which you might not think of as a data-intensive oh, industry, is going to be impacted. Really so I mean, you, you name an industry, we haven't come across a vertical market that's not going to be impacted to some degree. So increasingly, absolutely, I think you're going to see if not you know, CDO in, by name, there are going to be increasingly roles within uh, various enterprises that are, their job is going to be to manage and uh, really make better use of data. Well, we hear so much about data-driven organizations, and, and there's a spectrum, as you well know. Um, many organizations saying, ah, we're very metrics-driven, we're data-driven, but when you really peel the onion, they're not so much you know, data-driven. There are m many organizations, uh, as you know, Jeff, are you know historical pattern driven, historical process driven, uh, or you know very customer driven, for example, mm -hmm. uh, and, and, and so and that's not necessarily a bad thing. So, 
it's nice to say, okay, we're a data-driven organization, but actually becoming a data-centric you know, organization is, is, is not an easy transition to, to make, and maybe not always the right transition to make, but, but for many industries, as you point out, it will be. The, the question I have for you is, is the natural progression of a data-driven organization a data quality driven organization. What's your take on that? Well, uh, I think when you understand that any type of, any, if you want to use data to drive your business, to find new, uh, new, lines, of, uh, new lines of business, to find new, new um, lines of profit, revenue, et cetera, the only way you're going to do that is with good data. I mean, you can analyze data that of, of uh, questionable quality all you want, but it's not going to give you uh, insights, at least not for long, that are going to really allow you to um, improve your business in the long term. So it really wouldn't make sense to try to make the transition to a data-driven organization if you're not going to focus on having good quality data. Um, it's just, it, it's, it's the foundation, really, of any data-driven I don't industry. know. I don't know if I agree with that, because here's, here's why. It's, I think it depends on what industry you're in. So as an example, I mean, I think if you're in financial services, healthcare, the ones we talked about today, no doubt. But you look at look you look at the web scale guys. Mm -hmm. They're going after value. I mean, it's the quality second. I mean, this is Google, right? I mean, Google over time has looked at data quality as a process, and it's certainly improving its data quality. But it's made a lot of money, you know, with imperfect data. Uh, ad serving, you know, mm -hmm. has been relatively has been terribly imperfect, you mm -hmm. know, for the last decade. And now it's starting to get better. We've had guys like AeroSpike on talking tap ad, talking about how they're, you know, H streaming, how they're improving that whole whole system. But it's you know, there's been a lot of money that ex has exchanged hands, a lot of value created with imperfect data. Now, eventually it's a natural evolution that that's going to get better and better and better as a natural cycle, but, but, but I'm not so sure that there's not a lot of lo low-hanging fruit for imperfect data. Well, right. I, I, what I'm not suggesting is that you stop your business and wait till you've got perfect data before you start driving data initiatives. Sure, right. it's gotta, they've got to occur simultaneously, and it's got to be more of an iterative approach. Um, well, we heard today from Datrend, it's not a data quality is not a project, and and, right. I, and I couldn't agree more with that. And so, so that's to your point. Right. So so you know, constantly improving your data quality is not at odds with uh, with the big data approach of the web scale companies, for example. I mean, certainly you know the there there's plenty of low hanging fruit, but as you as you just said, even even the Googles of the world, the Facebooks of the world, are working to improve the quality of their data as they. Uh, evolve their operations. So, you know, it's what I'm not saying is, you know, you hold the presses, stop your stop your business until you've got perfect data. That's that's not the way to go. It's much more of an iterative approach, but if the quality of the data is not a core aspect of what you're thinking about as you're moving forward, you could quickly find yourself in a position where you've invested a lot of money and time and in, in people and technologies to manipulate and analyze data, but to no avail when the underlying data, the raw material just is inaccurate, so um, they've got to evolve, kind of side by side. Uh, but you just you simply can't ignore data quality, and of course it does depend on the use case as well. If you're serving ads on, online, that's one use case, and there's a certain threshold for for data quality you want to reach. If you're you know prescribing medications to critically ill patients, there's a different threshold. So you know th how you balance those will depend by industry, by work, uh, by by use case. But I don't think there's even in the large web scale companies, I think data quality still has got to be, um, you know, part of their uh, overall initiative. All right, Jeff Kelly. Well, listen, I really appreciate you hanging with us today, and um, and and all the the preparation uh, for this event. Uh, I really uh, appreciate the the invite from the folks at MIT and the collaboration with Paul Gillen, who will be uh, co-hosting with me for tomorrow, and um, and look forward to that. So. Keep it right here tomorrow. We start at 10.30 Eastern time, uh, and we will open it up, have our first guest on around 10.40, and go most of the day. I think we end, you know, mid-afternoon tomorrow. Uh, tw you can tweet me. I'm at D Vellante. Uh, uh, you can tweet at The Cube, our, uh, our new Twitter handle. So uh, appreciate all the feedback and the tweets and the support. Uh, use the hashtag. The hashtag for this event is uh, is pound M I T I Q. Uh, go to siliconangle.com. Check out all the blogs associated with the videos here today. Go to youtube.com/siliconangle, and we'll have a playlist up shortly. Most of these videos will be up uh, by this evening. 
And also go to wikibon.org, check out all the research around data, data quality, big data, check out wikibon.org uh, slash blog. And, and also look for what we call the shock and awe page, where we take all the, the blogs that have been written about this event, all the videos, we aggregate them into a page. It'll be, it'll be called you know, something to the effect of MIT T information quality. It may already be up. I, haven't, I checked earlier, it wasn't up yet, but it will be up by tomorrow. So we'll let you know what that is. Really appreciate uh, you watching, your tweeting, and we'll see you tomorrow, everybody. This is Dave Vellante with Jeff Kelly. Have a good night.